Okay, well, welcome everyone. My name is Dan Patrick from OpsGility, and we're going to take uh, take some time together today and talk about security. Obviously, security is top of mind with the cloud, and you know that's really what we're going to focus on today, especially infrastructure as a service in Microsoft's cloud, the Azure cloud. So, uh, pretty excited. We'll go ahead and dive in and uh, chat about a few things because. Uh, we want to use all the time, and I really appreciate everybody uh, joining um, towards the end of the year and excited to see all of you uh, here today. Uh, like I mentioned, my name is Dan Patrick. I'm the Chief Cloud Strategist here at OpsGility. We're a uh, training company, as you probably know, and um, I worked for Microsoft for about 15 years and did a bunch of different roles there, everything from uh, being in support to being a consultant. I worked in the Windows a product group in security for a little while out in the field and uh, also did a bunch with IP television and ever since that time I've been working focused uh, entirely on data center virtualization and then obviously Azure so uh, really excited to be hanging out with you today and I'm also an Azure MVP um, so I spent a lot of time you know reading writing um, and, and working on you know, helping people understand the Azure Cloud. Um, and as a matter of fact, for those of you that are looking to get certified on Azure, the uh, 70-533 infrastructure exam, which is you know kind of what we're talking about here today. Um, actually, I'm one of the authors for the exam reference uh, book, as well as Michael Washam, our CEO, is also one of the authors. Uh, and that book's probably going to be coming out in January. So if you're looking to uh, get a refresh, you, you can um, check out that new book that's coming out. And you can follow me on Twitter. Twitter. My handle's right there at Delta Dam. So, really fast about Opsgility, you know, we're an online as well as a face-to-face -face or training company, right? We uh, focus on you know, helping people learn the Azure Cloud, the Microsoft Cloud, uh, Office 365 included, as well as, you know, just regular Microsoft technologies, Windows SQL, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, we've been, uh, we've been pretty busy. Uh, we did uh, 10,000 trainings uh, in 2016, and we probably did maybe 15 more thousand, I think, in, in 2017. And we've got 75 trainers around around the world. If you happen to be looking for some training late in the year here, we actually have a class that's coming up. There's a boot camp out in uh, Bellevue, Washington, if you're out west, so you can check that out. Uh, might be able to get a last-minute deal on uh, on that if you call the sales team. And speaking of deals, here there's a couple of offers. If you want to try out our website, uh, it's free for 30 days. You can use the code TRYOPSGILITY, um, and there's also a 15% discount there uh, for that one. Uh, for any of those face-to-face. -face. So, all right, enough of that stuff. Let's talk about what everybody's here for, right? Let's talk about security. And security in Azure, or really any any cloud, is really a shared responsibility, right? And this lays out, um, you know, the different types of cloud that there is, or, well, on-prem, maybe, maybe not cloud so much. Um, but, you know, what your responsibilities are. And if you think about it, you know, the vendor uh, really sort of takes on uh, – ever more responsibility through um, IaaS or PaaS platform as a service or software as a service, right? And this first one we're talking about here, infrastructure as a service, you know, you have a lot of responsibility, right? Everything from the OS layer up, you really need to manage and take care of, right? Uh, below that, obviously, Microsoft, for the most part, has you covered, although where it says networking there is a little bit fuzzy because Microsoft is going to handle, um, you know, a, quite a bit of the networking, but you also have your own responsibilities. So, you know, that's really what we're trying to look at today is, is what are your responsibilities and then, you know, what are the technologies that you can implement in Azure to make this work, right? Security is has been traditionally the largest barrier to companies going to cloud. In the last year, we've actually seen that transition somewhat to uh, people, you um, you know, resources, right? So either money or training or things like that. Uh, but security is obviously really top of mind, you know, no one wants to be on the cover of the Wall Street Journal or something. So speaking about that network protection, you know, Microsoft has sort of these zones, right, that they think of. Um, and, you know, if you sort of looked from the right to the left on this slide, uh, your, your VNets are kind of out there really on the on the public internet um, in some way, shape, or form if you're connected with public IPs, right? So, you know, Microsoft is, you know, going to be looking out for you with respect to DDoS protection, things like that. 
um, and uh, you know, kind of securing you at your public IP layer and then down in your virtual network that you build for your VMs um, you sort of need to take over right so you know you need to um, they're going to obviously provide you isolation from other tenants or other customers inside of the inside the data center you know your virtual network obviously you, other customers can't see your traffic but you know from there on you really need to take over right and you see a couple words here NSGs and UDRs those are network security groups user defined routing um, and also mentions network virtual appliances which is like firewalls and other things that you can deploy from the Azure marketplace uh, you can actually deploy from the Azure marketplace uh, you know there's thousands of different types of virtual machine um, firewalls and and you know different uh, types of images that you can leverage so if your company uses Barracudas or Palo Altos or you know, know FortiGates or something like that you can actually deploy those out into Azure and leverage your skills um, in those technologies to secure that those environments right and force network traffic through them either across subnets inside of the virtual network or out into you know back out to the public cloud or even across down to your um, your hybrid network right now um, when we look at sort of you know data at rest right uh, Microsoft has a bunch of different technologies and there are different areas here of the stack to sort of think about um, up at the top with storage we've got storage service encryption I'm going to talk about that here in a little bit um, but basically this is an auto encrypting technology that Microsoft implements um, then at the virtual machine layer, there's things like, you know, BitLocker, other partner devices like we were just talking about, uh, maybe using something like um, SQL um, Transparent Data Encryption or TDE um, on a SQL server itself then there's TDE on the PAS layer for SQL DB I'm going to show you some of that uh, and then there's other technologies like the .NET crypto um, libraries and always on um, encryption and things like that that uh, are a part of you know either the .NET framework or .NET with SQL things like that um, that can be uh, deployed into Azure for your data at rest needs right now one of the um, things that's out there to sort of start to learn uh, from Microsoft is uh, what's known as the Azure Trust Center and the Azure Trust Center is a website you can just you know Google or Bing it and find this and this uh, website is fantastic it will help you to answer lots of questions that you might get from you know your, your risk providers your management things like that when you're looking at this and you know there's many different things here in terms of compliance uh, you can look at the compliance offerings that Microsoft has how they do security um, you know sort of an overview of that and how that works um, common questions that people will get are you know like who owns my data if it's in the Microsoft cloud and the answer to that is is you do right uh, but there's always caveats right so when people ask me well how do I learn about the security what does Microsoft do what do I do this is a great place to start um, as well as if you get questions from your risk management CSO um, you know chief security officer somebody like that um, definitely a good uh, place to direct them because it's really going to have the real information right so when we look at controlling some of these services some things that we kind of need to think about or uh, best practices first would be you know using some of the technologies like multi-factor authentication right I'm going to show you a, an MFA login here in a little bit um, using role-based access control right Microsoft allows you to leverage your users and groups that are in AD and synchronize them out to the cloud and then secure things the way you always have done right um, where you put people in groups and then you give access uh, to whatever people need via those groups um, and that's you know sort of the way that that you want to do things on-prem and also in the cloud using least privilege right least privilege is um, you know a concept that's been around forever right and the idea being that you know we only want to give people exactly what they need in order to get their job done and nothing more so starting with no rights and slowly giving them rights until they can do what they need to do and that has to do with you know individuals as far as user accounts or um, service accounts things like that a lot of service accounts out there that are just enterprise admin <laughs> right um, not a good practice uh, as well as from the network the same way 
right? Uh, if all you need to do is get to port 80 and 443 on a web server, you don't open up every single port, right? We lock it, everything down on a firewall to zero and only open up what we need right um, and then also there's the ability to create custom roles for you know different types of, of users on our network so for example if we had our users that are um, maybe on our service desk team they're admins and they do things like log in and maybe you know flush print queues or things like that we'll just give them access to that and create a role so that we can assign that role to them that way we're not giving them more than they need because um, there's two reasons for that. The first is is accidental issues, right? You know, if a person isn't allowed to restart a VM, why should they have the rights to be able to do that? Because in the Azure portal, if you've been in there, one little click and you can start it or stop it or delete it, right? And so having um, the, the posture of let's only give them what they, they need is going to give them that. And then the other piece is, is that honestly, the majority of hacks start with someone who has some kind of access, right? Um, and that's, uh, you know, just a function of human beings. And, you know, for whatever reason, someone gets compromised and they start giving access to people who shouldn't have it. That's when we really have problems, right? You know, brute force attack is ugly, right? Hackers will do it. But if they can get in with a way with no one even realizes that they're being attacked, that's even better, right? There's a, a, a common uh, thing that's been around for a while that basically says that uh, the time that it takes a user once they're on the network to um, get root access or get admin access is about 48 hours right now is what they say so if a malicious actor gets on your network it only takes them a couple days typically to um, arrive at that access and then you know in the enterprise in general it takes almost 180 days before that access or that penetration has been found okay so um, you know we want to use least privilege at all times so um, some some other pieces when we're starting to look at the infrastructure is you know storage storage is a critical part of you know what we're using day to day in Azure right it's going to be used for virtual machines it's going to be used for websites who knows what all because it's just an amazing technology right um, and there's a couple of key things that are really important to understand the first is is that there are storage access keys there's a way to just get directly into those keys right um, get directly into that storage account and that's through the keys now you can roll those keys is what we call it where you turn them over um, on a regular basis or you know maybe you have a storage administrator leave something like that so rolling those keys on a regular basis is obviously a good idea there's two other key technologies one is called a shared access signature right and this is basically um, deployed as a, a URL if you will so it's a, a URL that has rights in it and that gives uh, people rights or applications rights typically this is used with applications but embedded in the URL it will say what they can do and then there's policies and those access policies allow us to you know assign some rights like reading or writing or something like that to um, typically a blob container right is where we do this um, and we allow people to have access to to simply what they need right so I'm going to show you that in a minute in a quick demo I'm going to do but those are kind of the the basics now one of the um, awesome things that Microsoft has done and huge kudos to them uh, for this is the Azure storage um, service encryption technology and basically what this does is it encrypts the storage you know data in your storage account automatically Okay, and the beautiful thing about this is, is you don't have to do anything, right? So you um, simply create a storage account and it's automatically turned on. Now, if you uh, have existing storage accounts that sort of predated this technology, you're in a little bit of a pickle because you can go and you can see on the slide here where it shows uh, that little red box where you can enable it. Now, what they've said is, is that any data that was there before you enabled it is not encrypted. Okay, so you need to consider that um, in terms of where you're at from your um, exposure. But you know, once you have this turned on, anything you save in the future would obviously uh, be covered in encryption. And this is a, a Microsoft key; it's on their side. You don't have to do anything. Um, it's a lot like that transparent data encryption we were talking about a minute ago from SQL Server, where you know it's just encrypted, which is fantastic, right? And we've seen quite a few. Um, 
issues lately of you know data just sitting out in storage accounts and buckets and things like that around the internet where people are just finding them right you know finding them there was a pretty famous one where someone just found some keys just sitting in a bucket out on the internet recently so um, you know make sure that you leverage this technology um, and you know know that from now on when you create one of those that uh, that your your data is encrypted by default uh, they do also have customer managed keys in preview right last time I checked it was in preview so you know the original keys are Microsoft managed keys eventually you'll be able to use your own keys now when we look at that um, that access policy you know this is what I was mentioning a minute ago where you can uh, effectively put a policy like on a blob or a container um, and you know you can do it for other things file shares and that sort of thing too but you know effectively what you're doing here is you're giving some sort of a permission and um, the one nice thing is it does you can do this with expiration dates right and I wanted to uh, give you a quick um, view of how to you know, do a little security out in um, in the blob service so what I've done here and hopefully uh, you can see this okay I've got a uh, a storage account right I've got a um, storage account here called Ops Security Webinar I think so yeah, that's what it's called and I have a, a, a blob container that I created called Webinar you see that there and inside of that there's a file right so this is just a JPEG file and if I were to open this up I can actually see the URL to that file right so this might be like you would have um, you know on a website or something like that if you're offloading you know your your web pages or your I'm sorry your pictures off to the the Azure storage service and you can see here when I browse there I can't get to it right so by default you know this is uh, I don't have rights now this is different than that encryption okay so you know this this file is actually encrypted using that storage service encryption but that's not what we're talking about here this is just gaining access to that file now what I can do is pretty easily I can just go here to the access policy and you can see there's a few options here that I can choose from so it says public access level if I you know go in there there's a couple of different ones there's one called blob it says anonymous read access for blobs only and then there's another one that says container which is for the entire container and the blob so I'm gonna choose blob what I want to do is I want to give access to this particular file and a person would have to know that URL now typically uh, what this would mean is it would be um, you know just loaded for a website right I mean that that's pretty much what would be happening typically um, so if we take this URL again you know before we weren't able to get there we should now be able to see the file, which we can't, right? So um, here's uh, here's Leia. She's uh, talking to Stack. It looks like she needs needs some help. It's their only hope. So we've got that there, and you know you can see that now we've actually um, exposed the blob to the internet, right? So you know pretty easy to kind of understand, kind of a, a silly demo, but it helps us to get an idea of how we can, you know, leverage that service. And, you know, think about this. This is one of those uh, beautiful things about, like, the storage service. You know, you can offload all of your JPEGs, um, pictures, PNGs, whatever from your website to the Azure storage service, set it up like that, and then your VMs never have to serve any of those files again to your customers right it's all offloaded to the Azure storage service so pretty cool stuff now let's plow ahead because we're you know we're chugging through time um, next up I want to talk really quick about the Azure SQL DB and I know that this is a PaaS service it's not an IS service but um, a lot of people are using it because it's just so easy right to, to leverage uh, especially those applications out there that um, use them for websites and that sort of thing now just like the storage service the SQL server right that is serving up your database is available on the internet right and um, you know that's a little bit of a concern obviously right most people aren't used to their database being you know exposed to the internet now what Microsoft gives us here is they give us the ability to control a lot of things and one of them is you know what IP address can access that server obviously we've got a firewall set of firewall rules here that we're talking about and you can go in and you can say what subnets or IP addresses that sort of thing and you can even now um, 
there's a new technology that they've just uh, it's in preview um, called service endpoints where you can only expose it to a certain virtual network right on a subnet that sort of thing so the idea here though is just to make sure that you know the people or the, the known websites or I'm sorry the known networks that you have can access this SQL server right I'm gonna do a demo of this here in just a minute for you so uh, hold on to that thought on the firewall rules for your Azure SQL DB now a couple other quick um, technology notes on the SQL DB to help you to secure this um, I mentioned the uh, transparent data encryption this is also turned on by default now um, I believe if you have old Older SQL DBs, you might suffer under the same thing I mentioned with um, the storage service encryption. It may not have been turned on. You can just go and turn this on, and your database files, transaction logs, all your backups will be encrypted by default. Uh, transparency is the beautiful part here. You do not have to do anything. No changes. It's application agnostic. It's you know database agnostic. You don't have to do anything, and your data is encryption encrypted. Right. So that's a beautiful thing. The other thing that I threw here on the bottom is enabling server level audit and threat detection there's a place where you can go and I'm going to show you in just a second where you can do this um, I do think it's a little bit of a premium add-on there's a little bit of a charge for this um, but by turning this uh, uh, the auditing on and the threat detection uh, basically in the background uh, Microsoft's gonna be monitoring your database and they're gonna be looking for you know basically is there any activity that looks strange there, right, to try to detect threats uh, against your database, right? So let's, uh, I told you there's going to be a lot of demos, so let's let's jump back out here. I'm going to take you to, I've got actually, I built a dashboard just for this. So here's my dashboard. So here up here I've got my, the SQL database, you see that? And of course, remember, when you create an Azure SQL database, there's an a SQL server in the background okay it's not a VM that you can get to um, but you know that's where those firewall rules are right so uh, if you see right here this is my uh, my name there you see the SQL server I'm gonna go ahead and click on that guy and this is my my SQL server that I have now what I can do is you know I can see here there's just a little button to show my firewall settings or I can um, click here same thing um, and the first one that you'll see is it says allow access to Azure services. Now when you turn this on, what this means is this means that services that are running in the Azure platform can see it, right? You know, right now this machine or this this uh, this SQL server can only be seen by Azure right because there's no other rules so the Azure um, is turned on meaning like if I had a web app in the app service or something like that I could connect to this okay so it's not just thrown out there um, but you know be it as, as it may you know it, it is sitting there but protected with the firewall rule now what I could do is I could add my client IP right so if I were to let's say let's go to ipchicken.com right is it ipchicken sorry about that <laughs> ipchicken see about what my uh what's my what's my website right or what's my IP address here we go so here's my current IP address right I'm using an Azure VM actually so um, take a look at that if I go here and I say well I'm gonna add my client IP you know, it actually was right there too I can save that and by doing this now I'm updating that firewall rule and what that means is that means I should now be able to connect from this machine you know before I wasn't able to um, so if I go back to the name of the server right uh, where was the where did it go what's the name of the server there we go copy this and we'll put this into SQL Management Studio I should be able to get connected right so so user and should be able to get connected up well if I need my password right doesn't this always happen in a demo and I can't remember my password so that's great for the demo, right, Dan? <laughs> Try that one.
There it goes. Okay, so now I'm getting connected up through, and we're connecting to this, you know, over the internet, right? And you can see the the name of the the database server that was there, right? Now, if we went back um, to the rule and we took access away, right? So if I show that uh, again, and I deleted that rule, we'll save that. Um, then we'll lose our access, right? So there it is um, here, and you know, in a few seconds here, I wouldn't be able to get access anymore. So if I try to reconnect to that same server, um, I won't get uh, I won't get access to it. It'll take a couple minutes um, for that to to update. Now let's go back and take a look at the DB, right? So here's that database itself. And I wanted to show you the auditing and threat detection. Uh, this is really easy to turn on here. Um, it's just a, a couple of tabs. You know, we turn this on, turn on the auditing, and then turn on the threat detection, right? If you click on the threat detection, there's a few different types there. So like SQL injection and people trying to log in, that sort of thing. So we'll just accept those. And then, you know, I could set up an alert. So I could send this to Dan at Opsolity.com and that would be me so if I if anything you know happens or if Azure detects that someone's trying to hack into our database uh, I'll get an email about it so uh, pretty neat stuff and then I did mention before the transparent data encryption this is obviously you know automatically turned on like I mentioned you can see it shows us encrypted right so we've got an encrypted uh, you know Azure SQL DB so Pretty easy to use again, but you have to enable things or turn things on. I, although I will give Microsoft credit on, you know, enabling some of these to service uh, services by default now. Um, I think that that's uh, a fantastic move, and um, you know, definitely kudos to them for doing that. So next up, let's talk about identity. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about, you know, different technologies and that sort of thing. But, you know, people are the ones that log into things, right? Uh, and so, you know, with respect to identity, Microsoft gives us uh, uh, just a whole host of options for connecting. And obviously, you know, typical enterprise is going to have Active Directory deployed um, on site. You know, people are going to log in to AD and then they're going to get access to what they get access to. Now, that gets a heck of a lot more complicated when we start working in a, in a web world, right? Um, and what we're looking at today in kind of the modern deployments is, you know, Office 365, you know, different types of applications, you know, probably running in Azure or potentially other places, and then even, you know, third parties, right, like GoToMeeting or Dropbox or things like that, Salesforce, all of these are very, very typical. And... The big challenge is, is all of those are secured, right? Um, and typically they're secured with an ID that's different. Now we want to change that. We need to take control of that back. And so what Microsoft does is they give us this awesome thing called Azure Active Directory, right? And if we synchronize those identities together, then we can use that same, you know, username and password or you know mechanism, if you will, uh, around the internet. And the beauty of this is that users only have to manage one identity. We all have way too many usernames and passwords. And Active Directory and Azure AD working together does this for us. And the company only has one ID to manage as well. You know, imagine if all of the sales team was logging into Salesforce.com with their Gmail accounts or something right? Um, when they leave, they would still be able to have access to all the sales data, all the customer names, all their phone numbers, that sort of thing. Um, and that's obviously bad. Or even worse, think about Dropbox, right? Um, not being able to cut people off. What we really want to be able to do is, A, manage their identity, once again, just from AD, the way we do today. If today's their last day, we want to lock their account, which locks them out of everything, right? Or if today's their first day, we want to give them access to everything without running around to a million websites, right? Or how about them changing their passport? So there's a, a number of scenarios, right, where, you know, securing the Azure platform, if you will, is going to leverage this technology and extend what you've done probably for going on almost 20 years now, right? I mean, AD is almost 20 years old, if you can believe that. Um, I remember when it was called NT5. Uh, but, you know, extending that out to the Internet, if not cloudifying almost, if you will, their their user IDs. Now there's two, um, you know, kind of well-known 
um, identity models here. There's a couple other ways to to do this as well, but you know the two kind of typical ones, and the, the first one I just showed you is known as same sign-on. And you know people commonly refer to it as refer to these things as single sign-on. You hear that thrown around a lot, but just to be sort of accurate, same sign-on means that you know I'm really using the exact same username and password or you know functionality, if you will, to get into whatever I'm uh, allowed to, right? So, you know, to, to put it simply, the same, you know, control alt delete in the morning, you know, Dan and Obstility and, you know, whatever my password is, fuzzyunicorns99.com, that same functionality is going to work for Office 365. It's going to work to get on a local share, a print queue. It's going to work in Dropbox, right? Now, below that is you know, the real single sign-on where we have like an ADFS infrastructure, right? And what happens there is we're actually doing a full authentication back to a domain controller via ADFS uh, in that whole infrastructure. Now, that's more complicated and it's going to be more complex for users to implement, right? So, um, and companies to implement. There's a few others we don't have time to talk about today, but um, you know that's kind of the basics. So really fast, if you've never seen one of these multi-factor authentications, let me uh, let me just do one. I'm I'm literally I'm going to let me open up a an incognito or a private window, and I'm going to log into the portal for Opsgility.com. If you've been on our website, you know it runs on Azure through to through. It's, uh, essentially, Azure Platform as a Service um, uses the you know, web apps and all kinds of things, as well as the CDN and SQL Server, all kinds of different pieces of Azure are leveraged on our website. I'm sure you probably assume that. And I'm going to log in here. I'm going to use my work account. So this is my true uh, work account. Now, you're not going to see anything under the covers. So don't get too excited. But I am logging into the Azure portal, right? Let's see if I can remember this password. Uh, hey, there we go. And what's going to happen is, look at that, I got a challenge of, you know, a, um, a text, and I actually did just get a text on my phone, if you heard that. Now, to log into my phone, I have to use a fingerprint, too. So, you know, to even get to that, if I didn't see it in the millisecond it came across, I'd have to have my finger. Hopefully no one cuts it off to try to get into Azure. But, hey, and so here's the code that Azure sent me. This is only going to be valid for a small period of time. But, you know, I'm obviously I'm putting in that code there. And when I click verify, I should get logged in. So that this is, you know, what we call it like a multi, uh, multi-step multi sort of login, right? So, you know, so here we go. So now I'm actually in the um, the a the ad tenant that we use for um, that we use for opsgility.com. So I've actually logged in and you saw that we had that challenge for uh, multi-factor, right? So this is the production tenant, so I stay out of it. So I'm going to log out, um, but you know, pretty simple. I'm sure that you've all done that for you know some other websites or what have you. But the beautiful thing is is that you can implement what you just saw with only a few clicks for your organization, right? Now you do have to have the right licensing and that sort of thing, but uh, it's pretty easy to get done, right? So let me uh, talk really fast about the role-based access control. You know, uh, in Azure you have your subscriptions and then there's these things called resource groups and then we maybe have our virtual networks and that sort of thing. And we can, you know, apply rules to these on who, get ac who gets access to what. Right. Um, and, you know, those roles are really uh, based on what we want those people to be able to do. Right. And of course, this is also showing you tags, which is a way to, you know, put some metadata on uh, individual resource groups or, or resources, if you will. All right, let's take a turn over to infrastructure and start talking a little bit more about how to protect that, right? Now, there's a lot of tools that are available to you, right? You know, isolated virtual networks, the network security groups, which are like firewall rules, virtual appliances like, you know, we mentioned the Palo Altos, Fortigates, that sort of thing. Um, app service environment, which is uh, basically an environment that's isolated only for you to run like the, the real Azure web apps. And then other things like encrypting disks and anti-malware um, support and that sort of thing. Now when we look at the virtual networks, we want to um, typically isolate workloads into different subnets. That's always the best practice, right? Um, and deploying the network security groups to minimize the attack area. So those network security groups are basically stateful firewall rules that you know we can say what's in, what's out, what protocol, that sort of thing. 
So um, typically what we say is they're five tuples. So um, they're, they're based on, you know, the source and destination IP addresses, the uh, port that whatever the traffic is going to run on, and then the protocol that's going to be used, right? Now, avoiding exposure to the Internet except where absolutely necessary makes total sense. There's no different. You should always think of Azure as just another data center, right? Because that's really what it is for you, okay? So the same methodologies that you use in your own data center should be leveraged out there, right? And then controlling routing. So, you know, using, if we're going to use those um, network appliances like the next generation firewalls or maybe web application firewalls, things like that that are available from the many uh, Microsoft partners, we want to force traffic through those, right? So traffic that's inbound from the internet should come through a Palo Alto and go to the back end, right? When it goes out, it should go back out, you know, the same way, okay? So kind of creating a DMZ and that sort of thing. So let me show you a quick network security group example. So if you see here, we've got a network, um, you know, that someone's built or using a, a class B um, private IP address, and they've got, it looks like, you know, four web servers here. So that's, uh, this is an open source version. It's Engine, uh, Nginx. So we've got four web front ends behind an Azure load balancer, it looks. And then there's a separate subnet for uh, a PostgreSQL uh, back end, right? And so, you know, if we think about the traffic coming in here, uh, the first thing we want to do is we would want to allow that network in with a network security group. And in that network security group, an example here might be that this is traffic coming from the Internet. Um, don't care what port it's coming from, but we care what port it's coming to, which is port 80. And we're only allowing it to go to that subnet. So you see how the, the rule matches the subnet number. Right now, what we don't want is we don't want people from the internet talking directly to the database. Right, we want to make it so that only the web servers that are in the the web subnet can talk to the SQL servers in the SQL subnet. Right, so here what we have is another rule, and this one is called PostgreSQL Security Group, and here we're basically saying that traffic from the web subnet that's bound for port 5432, which is like the port default Postgre. Um, port uh, can only go to the SQL subnet. So you see how the subnet ranges, you see the CIDR ranges match up with the subnets we have. So as a result of this, then, you know, we can actually have a functioning and somewhat secured network. Now remember, you will have the potential, depending on the operating system, to have firewalls on those operating systems, right? So there could be IP tables or something like that on these Linux boxes. You have to open up the right ports there too, right? So if you think back to that original network slide I show you where it had those lots of concentric circles, right? Remember those those concentric circles that I showed you? Remember this slide back here where we have all these rings, right? So there's sort of defense rings. You could think about them, you know, think about like a castle in medieval times. You know, you have like the moat and then the wall and then an inner wall and that sort of thing. And that's what we're we're trying to go for here. Right, and that's what um, the network security groups give us the ability to do, right, including all the way down into the operating system itself. Okay, now with respect to pen testing, Microsoft does continuous pen testing, they have that on their website. If you go out to that trust center, you can read about that. And uh, there is also a way for you to do your own pen testing, right? Um, there's a URL I put down here for you. Uh, you can search for the Microsoft Security uh, Center um, and find the pen test pretty easily. And this is where you request basically to do your own pen test, right? Um, so you can do um, some of your own pen testing and they will um, ask, you know, what you're doing, that sort of thing. There's a, f a list of sort of known um, tests that are pretty easy to get through if you're going to do something different than that. Uh, you really have to work with them so that they don't cut things off because they're worried that someone's trying to hack you because that's what it's going to look like, right? So let's go back and take a look at network security groups really fast. And I want to show you, you know, by default, if we take a look at, like here I've got a, a virtual machine. It's called Sec Webinar VM1. This is a Linux box, right? It's running Ubuntu. And if I go to the networking section, I can see that there's a network security group that is on this machine, right? It's called, you know, I see it there, it says Sec Webinar VM1 NSG. Now this was created because I made this machine in the, uh, the, uh, the Azure portal and it has uh, some defaults. So anything, um, you know, VNet to VNet, 
will go through. Anything from a load balancer will go through. Uh, but it also is allowing in SSH um, traffic so I can, you know, get to this machine. So, you know, from the Internet, if you will, get out of all this, you know, I can um, – double click here on a putty session and I'll be able to get through right so this allows me to get through out um, on the internet via that rule right now these rules can be applied to either um, the network interface which is where this is or the subnet itself so um, you know this machine right here is sitting on something called the default subnet of webinar uh, the webinar VNet. So I'm actually going to create a new network security group. We're going to um, cut off access here. So let's do network security group. And we'll open that up here. I'll say create. And what we're going to do is deny SSH is what we're going to call this. And we'll put it in that same resource group, security webinar. And that stuff was in East US, I believe. I do not know where it is, to be honest with you. So we'll have to go back for one second. Hold on. <laughs> we have, it has to be in the same region. And East US 2. Sorry. Okay. So let's go and we'll do this. Network security group. I'm going to create that. And we'll say deny SSH. Put it in our resource group. And we'll put it in East US 2. So we're going to create this really quick. It'll only take just a second. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually uh, apply this resource group to the subnet where the VM is. So if you think about it as traffic's coming in, it's first going to be interrogated by a, an NSG. Um, if there is an NSG on the subnet, it's going to, that rule is going to be applied first, and then after that, then the rule on the network interface will be applied. So we already saw that the network interface, you know, we can see right there, that one works, right? That one is uh, allows in. If we check on this, look at the inbound rules here, we just have the default rules. So I'm going to assign this uh, or associate this network security group to our webinar um, default subnet on that VNet where that machine is. Um, and this will take just a second um, to work. Now you can think of this, and you know, sort of the way we talk about this is this is essentially like uh, north-south traffic. So traffic into or out of um, that subnet is what we're controlling here. The NSG um, is on the NIC is more of east-west traffic. So the ability for machines inside of the VNet to be able to talk to one another. Now I want to show you something while that's applying. If I, uh, I also have a, a, a machine that is a Windows box that's on the same VNet. And when we connect to this machine, um, the first thing I can see is I'm able to ping over to that machine. So my um, my virtual or my secure web webinar VM one was it's available on 10.0.1.5. If you look there, I was able to ping to it already. So you know this this uh, VM that's sitting on the same subnet. We're talking east west here. They can see each other. If we try to get back now to that. Uh, webinar um, machine from the outside, from the internet, I'm not going to be able to get there now because we've locked it down. So if we try to open this back up again, as you can see, I'm no longer able to get that, right? So a minute ago, I was able to SSH because the NSG on the inside allowed it through. Now we've blocked it from the outside. Now, if we're on this machine here, we're on the same VNet. If I try to connect, um, to that, I could just put in its IP, so it was 10.0.1.5. I'm on the VNet itself. I'm not blocked because I'm on the same subnet. So here I am. I can, uh, you know, connect to that machine without a problem, right? Um, so, you know, that's the difference between the two, the the 
subnet NSG and the NSG that we had um, on the NIC itself. All right, cool. I hope that that uh, made sense and give you a little bit idea of how NSGs work. So let's move on. Last few things. We've got uh, this wonderful service called the Key Vault. And the Key Vault out in Azure can be used for um, helping you to maintain your, your crypto keys, uh, maintain secrets, as well as certificates. And these can be used for websites, VMs, all different kinds of things, right? Now, this is the service that we use for encrypting the actual virtual disks under our VMs. Now, yeah, your storage account is encrypted with storage service encryption, but the actual data on the VMs as well, you also need to encrypt. If someone is able to find a key to your storage account, downloads one of your VHDs locally, and that VHD is not encrypted, your data has been compromised, right? If it has been encrypted here like this, they will not be able to compromise your data. And that's the key. So once again, rings of security. We like the storage service encryption so that the data is encrypted when it's sitting in the storage container, but the data of the VM itself also needs to be encrypted, okay? Now the last thing I want to talk to you about today is an absolutely fantastic, amazing tool that continues to grow known as Security Center. And there's really there's three kind of pillars to Security Center um, that that uh, Microsoft talks about, and that's you know visibility and control, which I totally agree with that. Uh, being able to see what's going on is critical in today's environment. Um, adaptive threat prevention and intelligent detection and response. Now let's kind of run through these really quick. So from a visibility and control point of view, effectively this is a central place where you can manage all of your policies, see an all up view of your security um, posture for your subscriptions, as well as you know do discovery and onboarding. And the beautiful thing about this is, is you know Microsoft is leveraging essentially machine data and artificial intelligence across all subscriptions. So they see what's happening everywhere and then they can learn from that and apply that to your individual subscription in the sense of understanding what the threats are, right? And helping you to monitor those threats. Now this adaptive threat technology really is all about identifying vulnerabilities, um, assessing at all times and telling you what's happened. So across you know your machines, anti-malware, configurations of your servers, configurations of applications, things like that. And it also gives you, and I love the actionable, right? Actionable recommendations. So you know it looks at like your network security groups, your firewalls, you know these things that I've been telling you to turn on. This thing is going to interrogate your subscription and tell you whether or not it's there. So you, know, you can see there it says like enable the VM agent, turn on TDE. So it will tell you, hey, you're missing something. You've got a hole. And it might not be a network hole, right? It might be that you don't have disk encryption turned on on a certain VM or something like that. You know, one of those uh, nasty uh, things that we've seen over time is, you know, people that are out of date on patches, right? Uh, Equifax, <laughs> they, the entire team at Equifax, according to the articles that I've read, says that they thought that they patched that server at Equifax. That's what they said. They found out that it happened. Two or three days later, they had a meeting about it. A program manager was assigned to do something, and somehow they checked the box and said, yes, we patched this machine, but no, they had not. Right, and this is the type of, of technology in the background that could even the, when your process fails, you've got some technology to back you up. Right now, a wonderful thing also here is just in time access. So, a minute ago, you saw me with a VM that was sitting on the internet with port 22 open that I could SSH to. Now, what that causes is that allows people to do a brute force on that box. Right now, with this just in time access, you could actually lock that machine down so that it's not open to the internet at all times. When you need to get access to that, you could basically go and request it, and for a limited amount of time, the security center will make the changes in the background and turn it on. Now, you say, well, I could just go do that on my own. Yes, you can, but it's not a one-step process, and if you turn it on manually so that I can SSH to the box and forget to turn it off, then it's just on, right? And if you didn't have security center watching like back here to say, hey, 
Bobo, you forgot to turn that back off, then you'd really be in trouble, right? So this this uh, just-in-time access is really critical. And there's there's new just-in-time access um, types of <clears throat> technologies in Windows Server 2016, which are also phenomenal. So, you know, I absolutely suggest that you take a look at this for all of your Azure deployments because it's critical, especially you MSPs out there. This is fantastic for you. You've taken on the responsibility. You're a cloud solution provider. You've taken on responsibility to manage environments for people. One of the things you need is you need access to the box, right? Okay. Well, you can use this sort of thing, right, to manage those environments. So uh, really, really neat. And then also there's intelligent detection and response. So you know, Microsoft has worked really hard to kind of build into, um, you know, sort of uh, the, the technology here to watch and look for things that are happening right um, and offer suggestions to mitigate and you can even see you here where it shows where a brute force attack actually happened and was detected that sort of thing and then there's also this you know kind of interactive map of you know where you're being attacked from and things like that and if any of you have ever been involved in any sort of um, a real investigation after a security event I know I've been involved in a couple and you know, one of the hardest things to do is, is figure out what happened and when. It's just like a real investigation, um, especially if the FBI is involved. I've been involved in a couple where the FBI um, and the Secret Service, um, Digital Task Force, and things like people like that were involved. The first thing they need is they need evidence, right? They need evidence. So, you know, having this data uh, along with maybe using the log analytics capabilities to, you know, have all of your data in one um, place is critical to being successful, right? So I want to show you the um, security center really quick because it is really phenomenal um, piece of technology. And if I open up a security center here, the first thing you'll see is um, a little bit of overload. It's kind of like, wow, look at all this stuff I need to look at. Um, but what pops out to me first, obviously, is the recommendations. So if I click through to the recommendations, get a big, nice list here of what's happening, right? Um, and all of these I can kind of click through. Once again, always actionable, right? So always actionable is really what um, I love about this, right? So like here it says, you know, apply disk encryption. And it gives me the VMs. It says, hey, you've got three VMs here that need disk encryption, right? Um, now, it may or may not, depending upon the recommendation, be able to do something about it right there. Some of these are really cool. Like, look here, it says add a next generation firewall. If I look at this one, it says lab VM IP. If I clicked on that, you know, I could actually create a firewall from here. Here's a Barracuda. I say create. I put in a couple of pieces of information, and I'm off to the races right um, and it will integrate it into the environment that you are looking to secure right um, so absolutely fantastic now you can also drill into the different areas like here it says networking and it might show us like here I've got a load balancer with a couple of machines it says I don't have NSGs for these machines right so here's Apache VM1 doesn't have um, a network security group if I click on enable here I see I see that I could actually create an NSG right here so let's go ahead and do that we'll call it Apache VM1 NSG I'm going to add an inbound rule um, and we'll I'll tell you what I know that this is a web server so I'm going to put port 80 on it right I want to open that up but that's going to lock everything else down except for port 80 right so um, pretty neat stuff and uh, it's sort of all built in um, together there and very actionable to get it done same thing like with storage it looks like I'm all green in storage which is great um, so I've got you know all green on my storage accounts they're all encrypted uh, remember earlier I mentioned that if you have older storage accounts that don't have have a storage encryption turned on um, you need to go back here and check these out and make sure that they're good to go um, and then here it looks like I don't have auditing turned on on the server right so you know once again very much so action oriented um, kind of alerts right and there's other things like alerted oh look here it says my attack resources I got some attacks going on on this server right so here I see where I've actually got some attacks that are happening on my lab VM right so uh, you know a brute force, you know, that sort of thing is going on against a, a virtual machine. It's just my lab VM here personally. But once again, you know, this lab VM, if we take a look at it, use the Azure portal here and just type lab VM and get my contextual search going. Open that up. 
if we take a look, well, how are they getting to this machine? If I go to the networking, I can see, well, first of all, it has a public IP address, which means it's out there. And second of all, I've got 3389 opened up. That's a well-known port, right? So that's the type of thing that, you know, of course this machine is going to get hacked, right? The IP addresses for the Azure data centers are available for download on purpose. You have to, you know, people have to be able to get there to know how to use them. Right. Um, you're going to have, uh, you know, that information is going to be out there. So there's, you know, people out on the Internet that are basically looking for machines to pawn uh, every single day. Right. So anyway, I really hope that everyone enjoyed this webinar on, you know, security in Azure. Um, I would encourage you to check out our website, Opsicility.com. We actually have a five-day course. Um, I happen to be the author of that um, on Azure Security. So if you're looking to secure your enterprise, uh, you know you have some training budget for next year in 2018, or your boss is asking about it, um, you know, let us know because we've we've got that. And also on our website. Um, out there on Opsility.com, there are a lot of labs um, all about security that um, could be very interesting to you. Uh, a couple of those, just to sort of show you really quick, if you go to our hands-on lab section, um, I know that there's a couple of, of pretty interesting ones um, with respect to, um, you know, like the we mentioned the VMs, like uh, doing the um, sorry, here that that web browser is in private mode, so it's not uh, it's not liking the not liking this VM here. Here we go. Um, if we go to hands on labs, we can you can look at the uh, you know what was I talking about? I was talking about encrypting, right? <laughs> encrypting the uh, um, VMs, things like that. Uh, like here, here's a, a lab that, that I wrote that's all about encrypting um, your VMs in Azure. So if you don't know how to do that, you're looking at the website, you're struggling, uh, we've got great info on that here. So, you know, go out there, try it out. You can try out our real-time labs. You don't even need an Azure subscription anymore. Uh, we have all that built for you, and um, you can learn how to secure those virtual machines and uh, make sure that you don't get hacked, right? Well, that's it for me today. I really hope that you enjoyed this webinar. We're going to sign off, and um, good luck to everybody. Have a happy holiday, and you know, check out our website, Opsicility.com. Thanks for joining. Take care. Bye.